Good evening, uh, everybody. And uh, today will be midway between a lecture and a lab. Huh? Uh, because uh, with our goal is uh, clear, just trying to put together all the web technologies that we know uh, in order to create a front end, a JavaScript front end for our stupid, simple, but uh, it's useful for, for, for playing with. Uh, the, the task list application okay uh, there are some uh, oh it's it's not a lot of code actually but there are some uh, um, you know problems uh, uh, that need to be discussed and solved uh, because they are not uh, let's say trivial uh, to find uh, or to debug uh, at the first level so what are we trying to do we are trying to take the project from lab six so i opened the project from lab six to where i had the we had the um, close this, this one the um rest server so we implemented the rest apis for the task list hmm? so we had the get task insert task get task uh, get the list of tasks and so on so this uh, is you know um implements a, a whole server application with all the apis that are needed to operate that uh, that application we uh, play with that with the command line or with the scripting uh, commands that are able to co uh, call these uh, apis but for now imagine it's that this is deployed somewhere on a server somewhere okay we want to create a front end in javascript uh, and for doing that you can download and clone the project uh, fork and clone the project uh, lab 7 okay which is the new project for today which uh, that would be just a, a front end running somewhere else uh, that will uh, uh, host uh, all the user interface for the task list so we have not we don't have one but we have two web servers one lab 6 for the rest apis another lab 7 for the front end uh, since ours will be a front-end application and not a, ja a traditional website uh, uh, the um, work of the server will be very minimal but nevertheless we need a server to, to store the page okay so we have these two servers that need to um, exchange information and basically the front-end the JavaScript running on the front-end on the browser should call the back-end uh, rest apis from the server okay so we're trying to keep them separate so first of all first step uh, how to uh, be able to run two different websites on my computer because we need to si simulate emulate the fact that uh, what the rest api is running on some server somewhere and the front and the e user interface is a web application running somewhere else we don't have different computers we only have one so the solution is to have uh, the two flask applications running on different ports okay and so the question is how to change the port on which the flask application is running you can change it from the run configuration so i leave i leave the uh, i try don't not to touch uh, lab six so it's something but we imagine that the server is already there the, the rest server is already developed uh, like uh, the twitter apis like uh, the google google calendar apis whatever is there we cannot touch it it's running there so we just run it so i i'm on the server here maybe we set uh, the the what is that yeah it's uh, okay it's all set for running so i can run it and the server runs in debug mode on port 5000 okay as normal so we can have the log of the calls here in the server and we need to change the run configuration of the other server in which uh, we are running the interface mm -hmm. so for changing that uh, 
if you go into the runtime configuration of lab 7 you need to modify these environment variables here okay so you can set this flask run port to a different number should be different from 5000 so that the two servers don't conflict otherwise the second one that is started will not be able to um, to uh, claim possession of the 5000 port and so will not, will not be able for li to listen for a request okay so we need to run different flask applications on the same computer each of them should run on a different port okay for something so simple we could have just copied the front end into the same server as the rest api mm? but it, it will be much easier but just to, to make the general case mm, uh, in general you don't need this because the two will be really running on different computers but okay so this is the it's better to set the debug and the port explicitly to a number different from 5000 i chose 505 5005 okay and uh, so i can run i developed yesterday some uh, very simple front end okay which is running again in debug mode on port uh, 505 so this is lab 7. Hmm? if we open that i get a very simple interface this is just HTML, okay? Nothing working. I just redesigned the interface with Bootstrap to make it less ugly. Not beautiful, but less ugly than before. Okay? So imagine task one and task two, of, of course, they are fake. This is just uh, static HTML, okay? It's not complete yet. So just, you, know, you're, you see, task one, task two, is just in the code. So we need to make this dynamic right now this page is running into a web application that doesn't have the database i should put here not task one and two but the real tasks and for getting them i need to query the rest server somewhere else okay and here i have some actions like uh, an, uh, um, delete or modify or add so for adding a new task uh, i just added a new row to the table with for writing the name for selecting whether it's urgent or not and then inserting it hmm? so it's the, just the basics of the interface we need to give behavior to this interface so right now the javascript uh, is practically empty practically no well, it's not really really, really empty because uh, I have some JavaScript uh, for just for handling this button here but it's just uh, something that I copied from you see the link for from some of the many bootstrap snippets for doing some behavior so there's nothing there's nothing that has to do with the logic of the application so uh, we want to attach connect this front end to our back end Right now, the backend, uh, you see that here in the front end, lab seven, there were some calls uh, from the, for the home page, uh, for the style sheet, for the JavaScript, and that's it. And while in the backend, uh, there was no activity at all. It's just there sitting there waiting for a request. So uh, our exercise says, okay, uh, see the index.html template uh, that already gives a static example page mm -hmm. that we did to the, together the second task would be uh, attaching event tender to the plus button to insert a new task so what does that mean practically okay i have this button here i need to attach an event tender to this button when this event tender runs okay i need to collect whatever the user has written in this text text and collect uh, whatever the user selected in the urgent field pack them together and make a rest call 
right so when i click here i collect information from the user from the web page on which the user has entered the information create a json describing the, ta the task and do a post slash tasks call hmm? post into tasks and uh, so calling this this uh, post tasks function a api that is already developed before developing this i have a big warning uh, so the first warning was the ports uh, of the web server should be different the second warning is whenever we have a web server sorry whenever we have a javascript file running on a page by default for security reasons that javascript file can only make uh, re http requests to the same web server from which uh, the javascript was downloaded so i have a website like this index this website will give me it gi just gave me the html and some javascript this this javascript uh, is only allowed to do some remote calls on the same web server on which this site is running so on lab 7 on the front end okay so we th we cannot uh, uh, visit one website and that website will make calls to an to another website just take information from whatever site number one i'm visiting and send it to another website this is forbidden if there's a policy that is called the same origin policy so javascript can only contact the same origin from which it originated hmm? we need to overcome this policy because this front end is from one web, web server one flask application and uh, the api that we need to call is from the other application another server you say okay but it's always localhost right but the port is different so from the point of view of the web server they are different web servers so we must enable this web server to access since it is designed as a rest api server to accept requests coming also from other hosts from other addresses it was not a problem in python code because in python we can do whatever we want we can call any web server at all we just make a request uh, call okay in but uh, uh, this this same origin policy is one of the many security filters of javascript applications so the browser doesn't let javascript code do whatever it wants uh, it puts some limits okay so the problem ar arises only in javascript running on the browser so if the javascript running on browser on a browser needs to access some apis that were not offered by the same server from which the, the javascript was was served was given well we need to take some extra steps uh, the easiest uh, well there the it's a it's a complex stuff uh, because they created um, a standard maybe some of you already heard the name called the course cross origin resource sharing uh, which is some standard on top of http that uh, negotiates which kind of calls can come from a cross origin source so an origin that is not the same from which the javascript came okay so it's a very complex standard you can uh, have all the control that you need uh, and usually the browser take makes twice the number of calls so first makes a call to understand whether it can call the function and then it will call it everything is under the hood so we don't need to to care uh, well learning course is outside the, the, the scope of what we want to do but luckily there is a, a there's always a python library for the task there's a python library that is called the flask course okay um, which has uh, 
a very nice philosophy it has a sim simple philosophy when you want to enable cores you wish to enable it for all use cases on a domain so it's very simple the basic case you don't have to configure anything you just enable this uh, library and it will allow all the cores on all the pages if you want more control you can do that you can have um, control on uh, specific resources or specific routes from specific sources so you, say, you can say okay from you i accept this kind of uh, calls from you i accept other kinds of calls or i can just uh, uh, specify which uh, functions which routes uh, will be allowed or not hmm? we don't need this level of control right now so the only thing we need to do is just to add two lines to our lab six so if you already have a working implementation of lab six uh, you have to add these two lines one is uh, importing course so, so from flask course import the course class and then use the course class to decorate the application course app like we did with bootstrap app okay so we enrich the application with this new behavior and we specify which methods we want to expose I'm making it easy for you I took more than half an hour yesterday trying to debug why it wasn't working because the delete method was not enabled by default so everything was working but not delete I couldn't understand why well right now so uh, methods is, a, is an optional parameter if you only want to get post and put uh, um, you, you don't need to specify it but delete uh, needs to be specified explicitly so it's better to be explicit anyway so you need these two lines otherwise uh, the javascript calls will never get through we also will always be refused by this uh, server okay refused that's all they're not refused by the server in, um, but uh, rather they are blocked uh, by the browser hmm? but the effect is the same so this gives the server the capability of negotiating with the browser the permission to do these calls so the on this uh, i said before we don't modify the lab, lab six uh, okay we only modify it uh, in this way in this line line number 17 here okay so when we did that when we when we have done this we can go back to our call so how do we go from here we need to implement the insert task here okay the easy, the first part is easy just uh, f um, handle the click event on this button and uh, collect this data from the user okay it's easy we already have a javascript file that has been called we already have document ready function that registers some event tender on the toggle buttons that we don't care about and uh, we now implement uh, maybe the real case uh, uh, insert new task so remember we are uh, always working in the document ready function so what all we are doing here is to register event handlers that will be called when necessary and the event handler we need to register is the click event uh, on this button which is uh, how did i mark it it's this icon here action icon new task so this is the description of this button here so it's a link uh, that drops an image uh, with this with this action icon so i just need to i already marked uh, the html with an id to make things easier so I can register the click event on this link, on this anchor A. Hmm? Uh, I, I'm not using just the image, but also I'm wrapping the image into, an, into a link for changing the cursor shape. You see that when I go here, the cursor becomes a little hand. And this is the effect given by the link. So uh, visually, an image would be enough, uh, but uh, also this little feedback that the mouse becomes a hand tells the user that he can click on the on the element okay so i can register the click event on this link 
so it's the uh, what's called the my memory is very bad new task dot click and this requires defining an event handler that receives an event in this case uh, event handlers in jQuery can receive an event the, from the object concerning the event and then have a body the, the function body describes what we do so the first thing we need to do and this is uh, issue number three that I wanted to share with you today is uh, uh, when we handle an event we should decide whether the browser should also handle that event in its uh, normal way what I'm saying if I'm clicking here for example here in, on list the browser does nothing by default I can handle this event and then the browser will say okay you handle that I don't care I had nothing to do with that event anyway but if I'm clicking here this is associated with a link so by default the browser will go to that link you see that the page refreshes flashes okay that's if I click there there's a, a quick refresh there here in the title you see because actually the page is reloaded because it's a link and the browser visits the new page right now the, the new address is just a placeholder so it will still revisit the same page over and over again I need to prevent that because if I if the browser visits a new page it will delete uh, everything and I need to restart from scratch so I should tell the browser okay I'm handling this click event don't do your normal handling okay so if I'm clicking something instead of the browser I should prevent the browser for doing its stuff otherwise the browser will process my events and then go on with its own events and this is easy because we just have to say to tell jQuery with jQuery uh, no it's a suppress event is uh, no uh, oh yeah my memory it's pre prevent default prevent default so I'm saying okay when this method is called uh, then this event will not be processed further by the browser which is what we need hmm? okay now we need to process it first step uh, gathering data so I need to get the data from the task uh, description and uh, also from uh, the urgent information about whether the task is urgent or not so the task description is the value of the input text so I'm looking at the HTML how was this input text marked it's here it's uh, here input time text name task text so I must uh, get the value of the input element with name task text okay so there are probably 17 different ways of doing that one could be uh, getting the input with name equal select let me make it name equal to um, task text ah, so this is a CSS selector uh, in square brackets you can filter um, HTML elements based on the value of some property 
it is normal CSS, nothing special. So I'm selecting all the input elements. There will be there's only one with this name. And uh, or maybe do, do we have no? Yes, because we don't have an ID. This doesn't have an explicit ID, so I can use the name. And uh, sorry. And I get the, the. I need to extract the value, the current value of the value attribute of this uh, uh, text area. And in JavaScript, uh, there's a very uh, easy val function. It's val and not value because they wanted to make our life uh, more interesting. And uh, also task urgent. Well, uh, how does uh, we need to understand how these buttons work? So actually, uh, there's a yes button and a no button, and one of them will be the active one. So this JavaScript, uh, okay, it's something that uh, works by toggling. Uh, toggle class active so every time we change one of them becomes active and the other becomes not active so our info our what we want to know is whether the yes part uh, is currently active when the, uh, the user clicks on the plus so we only need to check whether this button here is active as is active meaning has the class uh, active assigned to it and so um in the html you see that uh, this button only the one with the yes is marked with the task urgent id so it's easy we just get the button with id task urgent and query whether it has uh, the active class in initial state it doesn't but if the user clicks this active will move from the here to there for them to yeah, there and so on uh, we'll jump uh, between the two so what we can do is to find uh, this button with the id task urgent and uh, there's a method uh, that tells us okay has class whether a given element uh, has a given class It's sort of cheating because uh, PyCharm remembers my comments from yesterday. So <laughs> that's why it, uh, the, 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 the right answer pops up at the beginning. S class active. So this is a true or false, false value. So let's make a test. see what happens okay so when, when we click we can see the value of these variables with the pop-up so we save the file here we go there we reload the page and we try to write a task example make it yes example true make it no example false sample three sample three false okay so i'm reading correctly this information the next step is uh, okay once i have this i need to construct a json for sending it to the server for calling really the the api the remote api so uh constructing a json so the first step is uh, gather data. This is just debug. The second step is uh, uh, construct JSON for the request. Constructing JSON in JavaScript is easy because there's a predefined class JSON 
with a method well there are two methods there are many of them but two very easy methods in the class json one is stringify and the other is parse parse is uh, giving a string uh, create objects so giving a json representation as a string that i just read from file for example create the javascript objects corresponding to that description and stringify is the other way around giving any value an object that they construct uh, create a string represent with the json representation of that uh, object so we need first to create the object that we want to send and then stringify the object uh, into json so what kind of object does our post api require so we go to the documentation of our server in our case documentation basically is the code uh, and we want to call this method here delete no what is that get post here post a new task right so the new task expects uh, a json request that contains two fields description and urgent so it's a small dictionary with two entries okay so we need to create to stringify a dictionary that can be created online in javascript with you know we stringify open and close parentheses for the call and open and close braces for the dictionary and these are uh, as a description called the uh, task description comma urgent task urgent so we have some loose variables we pack these variables into a dictionary and we convert this dictionary this is still a javascript object we convert it into a string So this will be our JSON data. The final step would be calling the, the API with this data. I need to send a post call to the slash tasks URI with this data in the body of the request. How do we do that? There is a method in jQuery called Ajax. We don't need the, to Ajax stands for asynchronous request http request so i will i'm not i'm not going into details if you want to uh, study uh, the, the the how the ajax uh, mechanism is implemented the idea is that uh, uh, when i call the ajax function the the browser my code or really it's the browser on behalf of my code will make an http request when this request will be processed by the browser sorry by the remote server then i can get an event i can process an event that will tell me that they can handle for the completion of this request uh, the idea is that javascript needs to be fast and the remote calls are slow so you cannot do them synchronously you must do them asynchronously so you make the call and then do something else sooner or later the response for the call will come back whether in the form of a okay success or an error and at that point in the future we'll have a callback function be handling this event hmm? so the a for ajax stands for asynchronous hmm? and j stands for javascript x stands for xml we don't use xml because today we use json but so uh, we need to create a call 
uh, it's the documentation of uh, jQuery Ajax function is here. It tells us that this call re um, requires an address, a URL, to send the call to, and a set of settings that are able to you know, customize the call that we are doing. And this settings is just a, a, a JavaScript object or dictionary. In JavaScript, the two are the same, uh, with some uh, parameters. And this here we have the long list, uh, converters, cross domain data, data filter, and so on, um, parameters that we can specify. So what do we need to specify here? So first of all, so the, the, the argument to this object function is again an object, so braces. And inside these braces, we put a, a list of uh, parameters. The first one, the most important one, is the address the URL should be HTTP localhost 5000 is the server slash API version 1.0 tasks maybe let me check So API version 1.0 tasks, right. So we are calling this API. We want to send a POST call, because POST, GET, PUT, DELETE, we need to specify it, method, or type. You, in a lot of, doc of documentation, you see type instead of method, because it's, uh, it's what the and, and old versions of the libraries required type right now method is more correct okay but it's the same it's uh, their equivalent the method should be a uh, post and in this call we, we need to send some data i think the value is data here data is the data to be sent to the server And the data that we want to, to send are, is our JSON data. Too many commas. The value of the string JSON data that we just constructed. And finally, we need to tell the server that our data is in JSON format. Because otherwise, when the browser send, sees a post call, it imagines to do some encoding that is the same encoding that it does for the for the for the forms so it will be url encoded now we want to do to force the encoding to be json and so there is another parameter which is content type where are you content type here we can specify which is the content type of the data sent to the server. Okay. Don't confuse it with the data type, which is the format that we expect from the data in the response coming from the server. So content type is the data we send, data type is the data we receive. Hmm? Content type with capital T right or not content yes content type should be application JSON it should be all this sends the post function when we close this semicolon here the browser sends this post call uh, an http request with these parameters the server will process the request and will come back with a response that could be an okay response or an error 
code and we have the possibility of defining what will happen later when the success response is received or when the error re um, response is received with these two other properties that are success error there a function to be called if the request fails for some reason or down more down there success a function to be called if the request succeeds and in this case this function will receive uh, as a parameter some the data that was actually received in the response in the HTTP response okay the Ajax call by itself doesn't return any data it's too early at the edges function time I'm just sending the, requ the request the response will come much much later and when if and when the response comes uh, a callback function will be invoked so if I have to do something I could define a success function how as a function that receives data and does something again in line so this function will be called much later after this object call that will be called when we click on the button and so on so it's all the thinking about the future what will happen in the future and if we want to uh, handle also some error condition we added the error um, um, property here but for the moment we don't have anything to do because we are just sending data on the server and see whether it gets loaded onto the, the on the database so are we ready to try it so we can go to our application reload it uh, by the way uh, I am not reloading all the application here first because we are I'm just modifying a static file so the flash doesn't doesn't care about that and second because in debug mode in debug mode uh, since I set the debug mode on uh, the flask application is called lazy loading so it reloads automatically every f every time I modify something so it actually is lower because it needs to reload uh, the function every time but it's more convenient for debugging okay when you run to production mode so you switch off the debug mode uh, then you lose the capability of automatic automatic reloading of the application but just as an aside okay um, so we should click on the button and see what happens on the server side here so when I click the button probably I will see a post request here and maybe something good happens hmm? so let's try to do here does it work okay I'm writing something and I try to click here okay what I get here is uh, options API okay the options is called automatically for the course uh, uh, handshake and then we have this post command that with response 201 let's I don't remember what one means uh, let's have a look HTTP code 201 created okay it doesn't uh, indicate that the request has succeeded and has led to the creation of a resource well good news and uh, so where was it post uh, actually is the response that was returned here no? so we were already good or oh, returned a good response did it work really let's have a look at the database Uh, 
and uh, okay debug application this is what i just inserted now okay i'm not cheating i can do it again so have a break no add and if i refresh here have a break appears so on a completely different computer this is the logic this was more or less the most complex part the rest is easier hmm? uh, and what is the rest actually seeing the list of tasks we are not seeing that we i added something but well, i didn't receive any feedback task one and task two are just static strings glued there nobody moved them so we need a mechanism for refreshing or reloading or for loading even at the beginning the right set of tasks in this page so we need the function to just delete the current list of tasks make a get call to the to have the new list of tasks and uh, recreate the table with the new with the, uh, with the updated content um, when should this function be called at the beginning when we load the page and uh, after we add something or after we delete something every time we ask the server to change the list we must uh, reload the list uh, for refreshing for updating the front end there are you know uh, stupid ways of doing that reload everything every time or we can try to be clever okay i only add one line or i only did one line we try to keep the others but they are more complex hmm? because remember this is also web app a distributed application that could also be other people from other front ends that are working on the same list so the modification on the list don't come just from me they can come from different people so there may be modifications to, the, to this list that i don't know of only the server knows so the conservative way is just okay i need to refresh the list throw it away and rebuild it from scratch okay it's you are paying some milliseconds but at a starting point uh, it's always better to be safe than fast hmm? better safe and, and and correct than fast and wrong okay so can you think how to do that well uh, we don't we we need to call a function a functionality so refreshing this list uh, from more than one place in more than one condition when the page loads when i insert a new element when i delete a new element so i don't want an, an anonymous function for doing that okay because i need to call it more than once i need to define an explicit function so in my javascript so insert new task is done we move to uh, refresh list of tasks so function refresh tasks that will be called whenever we want to rebuild this list so what does this function need to do first of all uh, empty the table delete uh, empty the current list currently shown list not the list on the server okay just the one that i'm displaying here the table then as a second step get the updated list from the server and we call uh, a get uh, tasks 
API. And when we receive the updated list, with the updated list, rebuild the table row. So, empty the currently shown list. When I created the HTML for the table, the table is here. I created a table heading, the first row here, task, urgent, action. A table body for the list and uh, a second table body for the form behind. So I learned from one of you last week that the table may have, uh, may have more than one body. And you see that they are also bootstrap understand that this line is a bit thicker than the others. So there are different sections in the table. So this is, makes it easier for me just to, what I need to do is just to empty this first T body without touching the second one that contains my form for inserting new elements. So I f with jQuery, I find this element, uh, I gave an ID to it, and delete all the children. It's uh, a bit uh, violent, deleting all the children, but uh, it just, they are, it just, uh, they are just dumb nodes, so they don't suffer. So it's something like, uh, uh, it's uh, the T body with ID, uh, what's the idea here? Task list body dot empty. So this is a J empty the jQuery method that deletes all the children of a given node. It conserves the, the, the node. It doesn't delete the node. You can also do if you the, the, uh, remove. Uh, it will also it would also remove the T body node. We want to keep the T-body node because we, we need a, a placeholder where to add the new stuff. So we only delete the children and not the container. The content and not the container. Then we get the data from the server. Again, it will be an asynchronous call to the server. So again, we call the AJAX function. semicolon there with a URL that would be HTTP localhost 5000 API version 1.0 tasks comma method get data I don't have any so the content type is not needed because I'm not sending any data but in this case I'm waiting for a response and so I need to define a success function here and the parameter of this success function let's have a look at the jQuery documentation again is data status and this one and jQuery the, the jQuery object so let's just list the parameters data text status jQuery XML HTTP request it's an internal object that handles the request but we are mainly interested in this data so the success function is called if the request is successful and in that case it will contain in the data parameter the body of the response 
response not request and so we have this data and uh, this action rebuild the table rows actually should be inside this function not after okay just if i did something like uh, var uh, task list equal to json uh, parse of data there, there are easier ways by the way but and uh, i try to use task list here for updating the table this would be wrong because remember the execution order i'm executing this statement so i'm clearing the table i'm executing this statement i'm sending the request and immediately after task list has not been filled yet It will it will they don't have a value yet because the response didn't come so this line uh, 61 will be executed maybe one microsecond or less after line 53 but the edit request requires some milliseconds to go through so you need to wait until the success function is called and only later i can use the task list this means that refilling the table should be a delayed action to be mm, handled inside uh, the success function if the function is successful then i rebuild the table usually after i call a nagex function immediately after i don't have anything to do normally because i I, I would have to wait until the request is done and so there's nothing meaningful usually that I can do un until the response came and when the response came uh, comes uh, the the control is not in the line after the agent call but it's inside their success function hmm? so we need to do it after but after doesn't mean below it means inside that's the asynchronous word and uh, okay data that's an easy way of ex so the data contains uh, an object let me Uh, have a look at the here because I don't remember if there's a short short hand for delete and uh, what is that yeah uh, usually wait, wait, wait okay data should be uh, will come as a string okay so I need to take the string uh, and uh, parse it in JSON format to get uh, an object uh, you, we can ask uh, jQuery to do this conversion automatically by specifying the, the uh, data uh, well, did that property that we, we said it's not content type but it's data type right data type here so this data type if uh, data type is JSON the function evaluates the response as a JSON and returns already a JavaScript object. So we can ask jQuery to automatically do the JSON conversion for us. Hmm? We just have to specify the data type to be JSON. So in this case, we don't need uh, this instruction. We already have, immediately, we have uh, data as the task list a 
okay uh, can we have maybe before using that uh, we can have a look at what we receive whether it's correct uh, so we can maybe do an alert uh, here just to stop the execution and we, i mean well we, i will make a breakpoint in the browser to, to stop the execution at this point and see what data contains hmm? uh, so we go again to the browser we load the page pull up the inspector okay go into this javascript and put uh, post uh, refresh uh, okay but it does nothing because i'm not calling this function the function refresh tasks is not being called yet so well so it will not be executed we need to call it uh, and when so one place where we need to call it is uh, at the beginning so after we are still in do in the document ready handler remember so in the document ready function we set up all the event handlers and after the event handlers are set up uh, we can do some startup tasks some some things something that has to be done at the beginning for example refreshing the task list task refresh tasks not task list so i'm calling this function as soon as all all the event handler has been set up so i need this save reload okay now this function is there i have the breakpoint here so and you see that the um, the browser is waiting because the debugger has stopped on this function no uh, go ahead okay I'm here right now and the data variable is like this this is what we constructed okay we constructed in the in the um, lab 6 we created one dictionary containing one entry called tasks the value of this dictionary is an array and the entry of each array is a dictionary again so to extract this data we must do data tasks index with tasks as a key then index with the number for indexing the array and then index with description already or urgent right okay so this is just to understand what kind of data structure we have to but it's already a javascript object here you see that it's an array with a with a uh, with the length uh, defined and so on so all the, it's not json anymore it's already javascript object so it's a dictionary that contains an array that contains dictionaries whose elements contain dictionaries okay so with this knowledge we can try to process this data structure so we need uh, to iterate for many rows from zero to uh, the number the, the size of the the array the array is data tasks dot length Closing brace here. Okay. So we iterate for all the elements of the data tasks array. For every element, uh, we can extract uh, the description.
what I'm writing task description with data the dictionary tasks the array I the element description the value and I repeat for the three fields task ID task urge Oh, I'm making different lines because it's the first time. Of course, you can write everything. You can use this data. So once we have this data, what can we do? We can add a new row to the table. So uh, how can we add uh, an, a row? So we had a T body that was uh, that has been emptied. And we can add new children to that t body. Adding a child in jQuery is called append. In jQuery, the append function adds a new element as the last child, yes, the last child of, uh, of an element. So I'm in the t body. If the t body already contains three or four, four rows, append will create another row at the end. Prepend will create another row at the beginning. So I will uh, identify again our task list body that I just emptied before. And I'm trying to append the content of a new row. So in jQuery, how can I create new HTML nodes, new DOM nodes? I can use some uh, real nodes, or I can just have a string with an HTML fragment and this thing will be converted into nodes because I, I need a TR node, a TD node, and so on. So I need to recreate a row similar to the ones that we have here. Uh, that we had here before, <laughs> before deleting them. And these lines are, look like this. Uh, row with the task name with an urgency and all these buttons here all these uh, icons okay so these icons are just uh, okay links uh, they, they they are always the same they don't need to be customized in any way but uh, the rest uh, should be customized with the name of the task and with the urgency level okay so we are, we are, where are we here? We, have, we need to append something like a new row with a new data cell with the, the description. So we need to exit from the string and add the task description. Plus another data cell with the urgency hmm. we don't have any template engine here to do the interpolation for us we need to do our there are other ways but this is the fastest one for today uh, plus there's a plus missing here and then uh, the last cell with the icons. So I copied this part here in a variable, nice buttons at the beginning, just to avoid repeating this long line. So plus uh, nice buttons plus the closing of, of the row. And then maybe like that. Uh, yeah, no, no, no semicolon here. And we close the function. So 
here we are reconstructing the, IT, the HTML fragment that we need on the page. As I said, we, there are better ways to do that. We can have a, a template, a model of this line somewhere and clone it. Okay, so that we just have to clone the structure and fill the fields. But we don't want to push too much uh, in the same day. And this uh, should be appended on the task list body and I, I, I iterate on the other rows. So, finger crossed. Remove the breakpoint. Reload the page. Wow. Hmm? So, right now this table is filled with the real data from the database. Have a look at the delays. You see it. You see that the table, when I reload the page, you see the table is emptied and then filled again with some data. This is my mistake because I, del I emptied the table and then asked for the data. A better way would be to as for the data, and only when I have the data, I should empty the table. Because otherwise, from the emptying of the table and the filling up of the table again, you have some delay which corresponds to the round trip to the REST uh, API server. And I don't want to impose that round trip to the user. So again, all of, all of these operations is better done in the asynchronous function. before the for loop so when I finally receive the data now i can wipe out the content of the of the table and start rebuilding it immediately hmm? so you won't you won't be able probably to to notice the delay anymore no sorry did i reload it no. well it's much should be much faster we still have one flashing because the table initially have some old content task one and task two that we should uh, really remove from the html we don't need it anymore it was just there for helping us so task one and task two wave them goodbye we don't need them an anymore so we start with an empty no i did one row too much task list body okay like this okay entity body okay okay and when we add a new task the easiest way we the easiest thing you can do is to call again this refresh function. So right now when we have a task, uh, the task will be really added, but the page doesn't reflect it. We can do that easily. Since we have this uh, refresh tasks function that can be called also on the, after I insert a new task. So on the, uh, the, ins the real insertion of the task comes in the post and on the success of the post so when the server tells me okay i insert the data 201 remember that http call then i can call this function refresh tasks again so the function will be called once at the beginning of the page and then every time i insert a new task in this way, I'm making two calls to the server. One to insert the task and the other to retrieve the updated list. Hmm? So let's see if it works. I am adding uh, this last one. And then it appears here. Okay. You didn't see anything flash because it really was quick. Okay, so this is the way in which we 
we need to work uh, no, with uh, this front-end application every time the front-end application needs to update some data needs to refresh some data and so on it will set up the, the data the information for making a rest call and then you receive the data and then the data so uh, in some cases you need first to collect the data from the page and then send it to the server in other cases you first get data from the server and then you distribute it in different parts of the page what's missing here well delete and uh, uh, edit basically delete uh, is easy again relatively easy uh, we can only so I, I leave this part to you uh, what we just need to do is to add an event handler to these buttons here and this event handler we set up uh, an, an ajax call with, with the method delete the only difficulty is knowing which task to delete because all these icons are the same so how can this icon know that this is task number three or zero one two two actually i don't remember if they start from one or zero or two or zero and this one is task number nine or eight how does it know it doesn't i should be able to store this information somewhere so if I add an, a column with the DID shown here, I could read uh, with jQuery the content of a cell of the table. But I don't want to show the data. There's an easy trick of storing data invisibly into HTML uh, elements with custom attributes. This is something that works only with HTML5. So in, uh, in all documentation, you don't find it. But it's a very clean way. So for example, we could, uh, when I'm creating, because you see that when I'm creating uh, the task list, uh, I'm using the description, I'm using the urgency, I'm not using the ID. But the ID will be needed when deleting or, where, or when editing the task. Where can I put it? I should, I should put it somewhere easy to find uh, from the button. I don't want to make the button more complex because it's already, uh, it already is. So I can put it uh, maybe in the container of the button here, in the row. So when I click on the button, the, ta the event tender knows this, with the, this variable, the reference to the button. From the button, I just to need to go up a couple of levels to find the TR element and query the TR element and say, okay, row, tell me which is the ID of the element that you are representing. So the row is the good uh, no, uh, place to store this information. And how to store it? I can store it with uh, some data dash something. So in HTML5, uh, the attributes starting with data are user defined you can use it you can use them as you want and so in this case it would be data id probably equal to the value i want and here i will store the id as uh, for example so i need to escape from the string and add the task id it's becoming ugly very quickly of course so i have the row element that stores the task id into a hidden data element attribute sorry then i have the, the cell with the task description the cell with the task urgency and then the icons when i click on the icon I can just uh, start from this and find the, per the TR element which is parent or which is including the current uh, button. 
Uh, I will show you the solution just to uh, it was the here insert task sorry the here uh, this one one possible solution so it's the event tender of the delete action okay and it's assigned to the action delete is as the class of the icon for deleting hmm? so i'm on the icon this is the icon itself i could i could go parent dot parent dot parent twice because the first parent of the icon is uh, no sorry the first parent of the icon is the link a then we have the td and up there we have the tr so we need to go up three levels if we don't change uh, the structure of the html but there's a very handy method in jquery the closest parent so the closed method goes up from the current element until it finds a tr element anything that matches a selector in this case the tr element so right now we we moved sorry from the icon up to the link up to the cell up to the row and from the row we can query the data attribute data dash id i called it and so i can retrieve it with the jquery data function and just giving the, the name of the of the attribute and in this case i'm retrieving the the id of the task that it will later delete tasks uh, five uh, delete and after i delete it of course i need to reload everything so each one of them they are all in the same uh, philosophy each was, each uh, function has a different challenge okay finding the id uh, constructing the rows and so on more or less uh, once you do all the functionality insert delete uh, uh, add uh, refresh and so on more or less the solutions tend to be similar in in different cases the most complex one would be uh, editing but editing actually can be implemented by deleting and inserting so the edit button basically what it should do is to copy this row this content down here and in a way change uh, this button from add to correct so to a check mark so you should when i want to edit something for example here edit I would need to disable all of these buttons, copy the value here, and have a check mark there. When it, when it's the check mark is confirmed, so it's we need to change a bit the icons. We, one possibility, yeah, there may be uh, you find others. Uh, then, from the point of view of the database, we can issue a put for replacing an element, or just a delete and an insert, since we already have the method for doing that. And then we refer to list. So it's a bit more complex, but we build on to functionality that we already have. A more complex solution that you find in real websites is when you want to edit, actually the exact row becomes editable. You can click inside and modify it. So that means uh, rebuilding that row with an input element instead uh, of a text, uh, and letting the user interact. So you build a row, you assign the the event handlers on that row and so on it's uh, a lot of a lot of work for for the for the small details that make uh, usability nice hmm? okay so uh, I, I will commit whatever we did uh, today huh? i'm not committing i shown it quickly so you have in the video but i i won't commit uh, it's not exactly like this because it's some variables are, are named differently but uh, i leave to you to try to implement the, de the delete functionality and um, one question is uh, when to assign these event handlers because you cannot even assign this event handler for for the delete 
at the beginning at the document start the document ready event because at the document ready this table is empty it doesn't exist so you will find no, no icon no delete icon so you need to assign the event handlers here every time you rebuild uh, the table okay so you will find your own bugs in trying to do that okay so i will commit today this part that we did together and then maybe after some days next week uh, next week i will try to up, uh, i will upload also the delete functionality and maybe the edit if i if i finish it in a, in a way that i like okay okay let, let just remember that this uh, this same methodology works uh, whatever the server is so right now we just control this our own rest server but you can control any rest api in the world with this mechanism Thank you.